Thank you very much. I appreciate your uh, attendance today. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the issues that we run into in the cardiac surgical ICU in um, our post-op cardiac surgery patients. And I'm going to do this by talking about a case that we see quite frequently, um, but uh, we do a high volume of these types of cases other institutions may not see so frequently, as well as expanding on those same issues that can happen to the general cardiac surgical population. So here's our case. A 30-year-old gentleman presents for septal, septal and apical myectomies. He has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with exertional dyspnea and angina, and he has failed medical therapy. So he was referred to our institution for surgery. So just so we can talk about um, what hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is, we need to know the disease of all the, the surgeries that we're going to be taking care of in the ICU. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it has thickened myocardium, and this myocardium is in disarray. So the cells are not n normally positioned. And the incidence is actually 1 in 500, or it may even be more frequent now that we're identifying other genetic variants. Symptoms, um, dyspnea, angina, palpitations, syncope, and very importantly, sudden cardiac death. And then there's several different types of variants. I'm just going to talk about two today, the ones that involve this particular patient, which include septal and apical. And those are the two examples on, on the picture there. So um, medical management for these uh, cases is beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and antiarrhythmics. And then a non-surgical treatment would be alcohol ablation. But this patient failed medical management and was referred for surgery. These patients also often receive AICDs to prevent sudden cardiac death. So then we need to know the surgery. So the Mayo experience is um, over the course of approximately 10 years, 1,400 surgeries, almost 1,500, and um, they're performed through, uh, for the septal hypertrophy, it's performed through an aortotomy. This exposes the obstructing septum and allows it to be uh, removed. Apical hypertrophy is uh, removed via a left apex incision. So here's an example of the septal hypertrophy and the um, view that the surgeon has through the aortic valve when they're um, taking out the muscle. And there's two cuts that are recommended to be made to get the uh, muscle out completely that's causing the obstruction. For apical hypertrophy, it's a bit different. So we need to get more muscle out and it's towards the apex of the heart. So that requires an incision um, on the apex of the heart that looks like this. And then after the muscle has been removed, it's uh, sutured back closed. So when I'm taking care of these patients in the ICU, the first question that I'm always asked is, what should we do for blood pressure control for these patients? And, oops, let's see. And what we commonly say is we just want normal blood pressure. We don't have generally uh, a variety of different um, blood pressure management strategies for these patients. We just want normal blood pressure. And in all of our time taking care of these patients, we've only had one patient um, have a tamponade from an, an apical incision. So um, there isn't really a strong fear of tamponade, although that's always something that should be suspected in any patient. So inotropic support, why? Um, these patients have diastolic dysfunction. As I mentioned, they have myocardial disarray, and so they have a problem with relaxation. And this problem with relaxation is worsened because they can have poor myocardial protection in the operating room, um, secondary to the thickened muscle and the difficulties with getting cardioplegia to that muscle. Um, they also have stunned myocardium just from the surgery and the cardioplegia itself. These patients often end up on epinephrine, um, just to support that, their, func their heart function. They're also very commonly on vasopressors. One of the biggest issues that we see in this patient population is arrhythmias, and the biggest arrhythmia we see is atrial fibrillation. These patients are prone to atrial fibrillation uh, at a higher rate than most cardiac surgery patients and um, at baseline pre-surgery, and then post-surgery, they have a high incidence of uh, atrial fibrillation as well. 
And unfortunately, suffering from atrial fibrillation is associated with worse outcomes. They have increased length of stay. They have higher inpatient mortality. Um, treatment is rhythm or rate control. The studies haven't shown that there's a difference in short-term outcome, at least, between rhythm and rate control. So rate control is important um, to obtain in the cardiac surgery ICU post, uh, immediately post-op. Now, we try to shoot generally in our patients for 80 to 100, but um, it just depends on the patient, and you really have to assess the patient's clinical condition and adjust the heart rate as needed, again, because of the diastolic dysfunction and allowing that heart time to relax. Uh, it also, if we have too rapid of a rate, then we can evoke systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve and cause a obstruction from that, worsening the patient's condition. A surgical ablation for atrial fibrillation can help these patients maintain sinus rhythm, but m the majority of them will still need antiarrhythmic control for their atrial fibrillation, even in the setting of receiving um, an ablation. So heart block um, is something that is relatively rare in our patient population, but it can occur because, as you can imagine, with the septum being removed, it's, there's always the chance for that. The majority of these patients have an AICD in place, and so it's relatively easy for them to um, be able to be paced. And we also place epicardial pacing wires on all of these patients to be able to pace them if necessary. In general, their um, rhythm returns, and they don't require long-term pacing. So stroke, let's talk about stroke. This is a big problem. Um, the patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have an incidence of stroke just at baseline before surgery of 1%. And this is associated often with the atrial fibrillation that they do suffer. In the general cardiac surgery population after surgery, the stroke incidence is 1% to 2%. And then for the post-myectomy patients, it's about 1.8%. So it falls right in there in that range. The management, stat head CT with angiogram. And this is to evaluate for a bleed or a thrombus. What do we need to do for this patient to treat them appropriately? I'm gonna talk about another case. This was a young lady um, who we had not too long ago. 24-year-old woman came in for an apical septomyectomy post-op day one, uh, developed uh, left upper extremity and left lower extremity weakness, and a CTA was emergently performed. This was um, her angiogram, and as you can see, there's uh, a little bit of a problem with flow right there. It just ends, just stops. So um, an embolectomy was performed and flow was restored, which you can see there, the flow has been restored. And this is what was removed by the um, interventional radiologist. So they sent this uh, to pathology, and pathology came back that this was myocardium. This is extremely rare to have a patient um, embolize myocardium. It's, there's been a few case reports. There has been myocardium embolized down coronary arteries, um, and it, be, it can be embolized other places as well. Um, this is kind of an unusual case. However, there is a high incidence, as I said, of stroke in these patients, and some of that can be thrombotic, and it should be investigated to see if there is something that can be uh, intervened upon. So, Another problem that we commonly see in patients is delirium. Now this is a huge problem and it's something that I'm uh, quite passionate about. Sudden disturbance in cognition, inattention, rapid changes in awareness and arousal, hyperactive versus hypoactive, disorganized thinking. This is a, a huge problem for the providers that are caring for the patient at the bedside. It's a huge problem for the patient themselves and it's a huge stressor for the families. There's a large incidence, 25% or more, in cardiac surgery patients, and you can see the risk factors there. The risk factors that we can intervene upon um, for these patients oops, sorry, would be length of mechanical ventilation, transfusion, and providing good pain control. There are very few other uh, risk factors that we can actually um, intervene upon to reduce their incidence of delirium. So outcomes, these patients have increased length of stay, increased duration of mechanical ventilation, higher mortality, increased cost, and decreased health-related quality of life afterwards, after they leave the ICU, after they leave the hospital. So this is a big problem. 
So what do we do to prevent it? Well, everybody's heard of the ABCDE bundle. We wake our patients up and do breathing trials um, in conjunction with that. We, we do the appropriate choice of sedation. We minimize benzodiazepines. We screen for delirium so that we know if it's occurring. Early mobility and exercise is very important, and it's something that I know we can do better at our institution with. And then we try to avoid medications that will either induce or worsen delirium. And a lot of those medications are covered by the beers criteria. I've just listed a couple of examples there, um, but patient, our patients tend to get medications that are on that list all the time, like amiodarone and other antiarrhythmic medications. And so it's hard to give them the, uh, to completely eliminate those medications and give them just medications that would be not thought to be associated with delirium. So prevention, do we have a magic bullet? So ketamine has been shown in a single dose um, relatively small dose versus saline placebo given at the beginning of cardiac surgery case to reduce the incidence of delirium. 3% versus 31%. That's really impressive. Um, why? Anti-inflammatory effects, likely, and neuroprotective effects of ketamine. There's been a lot of um, acknowledgement now of the neuroprotective effects of ketamine in acute uh, neurologic injury, and I think that our patients suffering from delirium have acute neurologic injury. So this needs additional confirmatory data before we can really hang our hats on, on ketamine being a, a magic bullet. What's another magic bullet? Maybe dexmedetomidine. A lot of people uh, like this medication. It's, it's great to wake patients up on in the ICU. Um, in this study, 183 patients had a reduced incidence of delirium compared to propofol sedation, 17.5% versus 31.5%. The, the onset of delirium was also delayed post-op day two versus post-op day one, and the duration of delirium was reduced. And there was no increased need for vasopressor support in patients receiving the Presidex versus patients receiving the propofol. So this is a pretty positive study for suggesting that um, Presidex might be a better choice for us than propofol. But there's conflicting data. So in another study looking at just 285 patients, there was no statistical decrease in delirium. And there was a decreased incidence, however, in pulmonary complications, interestingly enough, and a decreased incidence in intraoperative tachycardia that required some sort of a therapy, which is not surprising because um, dexmedetomidine does cause uh, some bradycardia, and it also does reduce uh, arrhythmias. They did show, however, an increased need for treatment of hypotension. So we just don't know yet. We don't know. Do we really have a magic bullet? No. I would say we probably aren't going to have a magic bullet. We're going to have to attack this problem from a variety of aspects and with bundles of care. And hopefully we can find medications that do help the patients and do help prevent delirium or even treat delirium. But right now we need to identify the patients that are at risk, do pre-op optimization if possible, maybe adjust medications for them, avoid medications that are associated with delirium, utilize medications like the ketamine or the Presidex if it's appropriate for those patients clinically, use the ABCDE bundle as we all should be doing, and I think very importantly for these patients is treat their pain adequately. We're often very tempted to not treat their pain adequately because we don't want to worsen delirium with the medications that we're giving to treat pain, but that is not the right thing to do. So treat their pain adequately. Only use sedating agents if the patient is a danger to themselves and avoid the use of restraints if at all possible. So my references, and thank you very much for your time.